Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today by my friend Paul Bogala, veteran Democratic strategist, keep uh, architect of the Clinton victory in 92, and senior aide in the Clinton White House, and very keen observer of all things Democratic. And <laughs> Thanks. And Thanks, Bill. Great to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. So I thought and we dressed alike. We wore the uniform. Yeah, good. It's okay. the new <laughs> unity in Donald Trump's America. <laughs> yeah. right. Trump creates strange bad, bipartisanship. Bad, yeah. bad, bad fellow. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Um, so we're, we're speaking just to locate it in what, early mid May 2018. Um, well, what's going on in the Democratic? I mean, everyone's talking about the Republicans. I'm yeah. very interested in that. We can talk about that too. But what about the Democratic Party? What's the effect of Trump? What's the response to Trump? Where do we go this year? And then later on, we'll get where do we go in 2020? You know, the challenge, first, thanks. Thanks for having me here. We've no, done this once before. Be. It's, it's always fascinating, and I love doing mm -hmm. these things with you. Um, the, the challenge for the Democrats, and I, I think they're rising to it, is to look beyond Trump. That is to say, there's two ways you can respond to the Trump presidency. You can say, oh, it was a fluke, it was a black swan, and it was, you know, but for 77,447 voters yeah. in Pennsylvania. That number is not sticking not in your that mind. Not stuck for in some my reason. head. Yeah, right. But Pennsylvania plus Wisconsin plus Michigan, all three states combined, 77,447 votes. That's not a sellout at a Penn State or Michigan or a University of Wisconsin football game. So you could dismiss it. I, I think Democrats should not and are not. Uh, first off, there's enormous consequences. But so how do you answer it? Well, you, you, right now, the, the lava is exploding. And literally in Hawaii, as we mm -hmm. speak, there's a, the Kilauea is erupting. And so when the, when we know how to deal with that. We know how to cover it. Right? Ooh, look at all that lava. And, and Democrats know how to decry it. Well, we're the anti-lava party. Lava is yeah. destructive and it's awful. Well, what I want Democrats to do, and I think they are, is look at the subterranean pressures that are causing that, right? And I, I think there's two. There's, uh, in geology, there's compressional pressure where one plate's on top of another. And I liken that to the income and wealth and opportunity inequality. And that creates enormous pressure in your party and mine, enough to cause a fissure that can make an explosion like Trump. There's a second kind, and I, I believe in plate tectonics because I'm a liberal, I like science. But the second kind is the plates pull apart, tensional pressure. And I think that's what's happening culturally. Right, and it's it's uh, advancements which I love on gay rights and women's rights, and, and uh, but it, it leaves some people behind. It really worries people. Immigration, immigration, especially. Right. So those two things are going on at once. So the Democrats have to, I think, figure out how we're going to deal with those subterranean pressures. I say I, I I'm hopeful that they're doing it, and I'm confident they are because of how they're running in these midterms. They're not just running around saying, "Oh, I hate Trump. I'm against lava." They're really trying to speak to the pain that's caused that and to get uh, back to middle class economic and middle class cultural and middle class values that the Democratic Party, I think, even created. Uh, we, I think my party created the middle class. We created the eight hour day and the 40 hour work week. We created the weekend. So I like that. And uh, I think that's what's happening in 2018 is the Democrats are trying to find uh, a productive response. It's not enough to just say I'm anti-Trump. It's necessary but not sufficient to resist. And I've been all around the country. I'm, I no longer do it for a living, so I do it for love and fun and uh, volunteer. But I've gone around the country and uh, campaigned with some of these challengers. And to a person, they're running for something, not simply against Trump. And I think that's really critical to, to my party. And what the, because the districts are such that for the Democrats to take back the House, very moderate districts, even conservative districts, so you're seeing the Democratic Party responding to Trump not by going off to an extreme, but by saying, well, if you're going to abandon the sensible center, we're going to capture it. And that may well be that if, if the Democrats take back the House, that will be the reason why. And what would make you doubt or make you less confident that they're going in this direction? Are there particular states or prim you know, primary races coming up or, or issues, focuses where you would say, oof, they're going off a little bit, not the, in the direction I want them to go? There are a few places where the Democrats are having primaries, even in really conservative districts where we'll be lucky to win. Normally, if you're in a really tough district, not very many people want to want to run. Right. Th there's been such an outpouring. This has been a blessing of the Trump presidency. It's an outpouring on the progressive side. Activist groups, there, th there was no such thing as indivisible just months ago, you know, 15, 20 months ago. Uh, and I think that's been terrific. The, the question is, will the Democrats tear themselves apart in these primaries? So far, they have not. For me, the model is Virginia, the first off-year election after Trump. 
And uh, the establishment Democrat, Ralph Northam, who's the incumbent lieutenant governor, endorsed by every single Democrat in Richmond, in the House of Delegates, in the state Senate, statewide elected. Every congressman who took a position was for Northam. Well, that's fine. Then comes Tom Periello, former Obama aide, uh, former congressman from the Charlottesville area. He's running on a Bernie Sanders uh, single-payer health care message. And they had a huge clash, and they had a titanic primary. Largest turnout I've ever seen, and the moderate wins by 9 or 10 points. Well, what happens then? Periello, to his great credit, busts his tail for the rest of the year, campaigning for the more moderate guy. Not only does all the statewide Democrats win, they sweep in more Democrats in the House of Delegates than anybody has in 100 years. That's the model. It's not simply enough for moderates to say, well, moderates should win or liberals to say that progressives should win. Then they have to actually come back together. And so far, we haven't had very many examples, right. but so far the early indicators are that they're willing to come back together, not because Democrats are better or more cohesive or more moral or more forgiving or more fraternal. It's because nothing unites the people of Earth like a threat from Mars. <laughs> and to Democrats, Trump is a Martian. And so what would be the threats just in 2018 from your point of view? I mean, I suppose in focus on impeachment. I right. Yeah, talk about that a little bit. Right. Can they avoid that? I mean, we've lived through it. They can. Uh, I mean, there, Trump there seems few... to me to somewhat cleverly, on his part, want to make the 2018. Right. I mean, and most Republicans think that's crazy. Why aren't they running on the record? I actually think Trump's being like a little clever, like a fox here, maybe. Right. If he makes the 2018 thing about, do you want me impeached or not? I mean, let's leave aside what Mueller finds, right. but in a way that rallies Republicans and Absolutely. gets Democrats sounding more strident than you'd like them to. Absolutely. I think that I, I would never do anything to minimize the Mueller-Russia investigation. It may well take down this entire presidency, but I also will do nothing to politicize it. Right. The investigation's going on. It is uh, run by a very credible, lifelong Republican and prosecutor. We have no idea what he's got. Maybe Trump is perfectly innocent. He's not acting like it, but maybe he is. <laughs> the last thing that Democrats need to do for our Constitution, but also for their party, is to prejudge. So I, I'm completely frustrated with, with people who are running ads in favor of impeachment, and those tend to not be people who are actually running for office now. It's, it's a, a billionaire in California, Tom Steyer, who seems intent on signing up people for impeachment before the investigation is concluded. I think it would be a terrible mistake. But I've talked to enough of these Democrats that they're not running on it and they're not hearing it. They're, you know what they're running on? The tax cut. Trump's most important accomplishment. Connor Lamb ran that special election in Pennsylvania running at the tax cut, against the tax cut, and he won. He not only won. With a standard Democratic, it's a giveaway, I want to cut taxes to, giveaway to the class. wealthy and corporate interests. Right, kind of and message. I want to cut taxes for the middle class. Mm -hmm. And I want the, the wealthy to pay their fair share. You know, 83% of the benefits that tax cut go to 1% of us. And it's not the poorest 1%. And it's not the 1% serving the military. <laughs> it's not the most vulnerable 1%. It's the wealthiest 1%. So I like that Connor Lamb went right at it. He was so successful that even the Republicans stopped advertising on it. They, so he won the tactical battle over the tax cut. The Democrats are running saying, here's the tax system I want. I want to reward work, not wealth. I want to encourage uh, more folks to, to go back to work and to join the middle class. Uh, so, so the tax bill. Uh, which is not terribly popular, and then when the Democrats run at it, they can, they can win, I've seen it, but also health care, which has, in the last few cycles, <coughs> been won by the Republicans. Right. People very worried about Obamacare, and they didn't like it until now that it's threatened. And, you know, the, kind of the joke I've used is it was Obamacare, and people didn't like it, and then we got rid of Obama, now it's just care. Yeah, right. And they like it. And so the Democrats defending Obamacare, and particularly the premium supports that help a lot of middle-class families, um, and protecting Medicaid and Medicare, which the Republicans have signaled as a result of their tax cut, we're going to have to make cuts in Medicaid, Medicare, even Social Security. Those, those are the meat and potato Democratic issues that uh, voters recognize my party for and that I think in some ways Democrats got away from. And I think they run on that, uh, and they are. That's why I'm bullish on, on 2018. And you think they are? I mean, you think from Pelosi on down and Schumer on down, the signals to all the candidates are run on this? And do you think they're, I mean, what, would, what could derail I, I can, it? I, I can say with assurance, with certainty. Uh -huh. I've talked to Pelosi. Hey, I'm lucky that way. I mean, I've talked to the people running these campaigns. Again, I'm out of that business. Right. But I know that that's what they're saying. I know that Nancy Pelosi's uh, opposed to impeachment. By the way, she was opposed to it 
when she took over the House and George W. Bush was president. I'm sure you recall, but there was this nascent movement on the right. left. Bush is a war criminal, obviously. Cheney's a war criminal. We have to go. Uh. She cut it off. She shut it down instantly, immediately. No, we're actually going to do things to help the middle class. And, you know, she's as democratic, a partisan democrat as you can be, but not transgressing those norms. Simply because Trump transgresses norms doesn't mean that my side should. And what would be a sign of ascendancy of the left, I mean, of the Sanders wing? Would there be, I mean, Cuomo losing in New York? I mean, would there be sort of a moment that would people would it's sort of... It's interesting. I don't see that, but stranger things have happened. But no, I, I think that um, right now, 2018, so you feel like there's real unity. Is, uh, the, the moderate and the, and the progressive wing are working very well together. There are uh, some tough primaries. The challenge will be, can they come back together afterwards the way that Northam and Perriello did? So far, I think they will. Uh, and I think it really bodes well for 2018. The question then is Do you think a strong, do you think, it, let's say the economy continues decently, pretty strong for the rest of 2018? How much do you think that affects the off year election? So far, uh, people, well, they, they are much more worried about the future. And they really don't like this tax cut. And so, usually, a strong economy really benefits the incumbent party. But there's still a terrible sense of this country, a ter terrific sense, depending on your perspective, that a lot of people are left out and left behind. And there's a lot of people who believe that your zip code it determines your outcome, like where you're born. And that's not the American dream. So I don't see the strong economy uh, uh, re-electing a Republican majority. The, the districts favor the Republicans. The economy is pretty robust. And yet, there is still this powerful sense that we need change, we need a check, but we also need a return to the middle class. This is where Trump has blown his opportunity. I'm not a fan, but because he essentially is a third party candidate, right? Right. This is why Republicans like you, real Republicans, don't like him. Here's my counterfactual on Trump. He's sworn in on a Saturday, largest crowd in history, apparently. Mm -hmm. The next day, 3.5 million people are in the streets. Liberal activists, Democratic, the progressive wing of my party, largest mass demonstrations in American history. He hasn't even done anything yet. What if on the Monday, <clears throat> instead of going to the CIA and insulting them, what if on his first full day uh, worked as president, he had introduced that trillion dollar infrastructure plan he campaigned on? He would have had Chuck Schumer, Bob Casey, you know, Claire McCaskill, a lot of Democrats on his side because we too think there's a terrific need to rebuild America, to put working class Americans back to work, black, white, Asian, and Latino. And he could have remade American politics because that still would not have solved the problem of the activists who hate him for good reason. So you would have divided your opposition. The Republicans would have gone along with it. They go along with a lot worse than an infrastructure package. Chamber of Commerce wants infrastructure. He could have completely remade this. He got elected mostly by the American middle class. I believe the Democrats are going to be resurgent because he's abandoned that middle class. And um, the, the, the things that he's doing are, are, interestingly, almost designed to hurt his voters. Like, here's one to watch. Let's watch Senator Deb Fisher, popular, able, no scandal. She's a senator from Nebraska. She should be reelected on a walk, one of the most reliably Republican states. If, in fact, these tariffs go through, they're like a heat-seeking missile at rural America. I mean, it is like, the Chinese are not stupid. They're gonna retaliate where it hurts Trump right. the most. They're not gonna target artisanal cheeses from Brooklyn, right, right. you know? They're gonna target, I was just, just days ago in Montana, in blood red state. You know what the farmers there are saying? Corn, beans, sugar beets. That's what he's targeting. That's what China, she, that's what they think she is gonna target, which, hurts them. So you may even see really red states, uh, senators in trouble if these tariffs kick in and, and in fact the Chinese retaliate and damage our farm economy so desperately. So I think that's the tragedy of Trump as a substantive and political matter, is he, he was poised because of his remarkable support from uh, white working class to remake politics. Uh, and you know he's completely failed, I think, and I think that gives the Democrats a chance to come back. So what's the most likely outcome in 2018? I think I, it's amazing to say, given the uh, districts, but I think it's better than 50-50. More likely than not, the Democrats retake the House. Uh, it's still not 
more likely than not that they take the Senate. I just think those states are so very difficult. So many races def Democrats are defending in very difficult states. Uh, that's when you'll know there's a colossal wave, which right. is why you're right that the president is cagey in raising impeachment. Because to get a wave, you need amplitude. And what happens, waves don't just happen because the party in opposition is excited. It's the party in power has to be depressed. That's how you get that amplitude, is a low uh, uh, base and a high crest. And uh, we saw this coming. This is, here's a canary in the coal mine. Uh, 2010, September 20th, more or less, President Obama goes to Maryland to a town hall meeting. Now he's had his hands full. He's trying to save the American economy, trying to save the auto industry, trying to uh, unwind these wars. He goes to Maryland and he has a town hall meeting and there's a woman there who's like the embodiment of my party. She's maybe 35 African-American woman. She was a veteran of the military and the CFO of Veteran Services Group. Highly educated, service-oriented, African-American woman in Maryland. Okay, that's like, that's my party. And you know what she said? She said, sir, I'm just tired of defending you. Now she didn't say I quit. She didn't say I want Paul Ryan to take over. She's not gonna switch teams. But she said, I'm just tired of defending you. He was doing so much, I think all good, but whatever, that he was wearing out his supporters. And it was just too much. I wonder if this president, who is a whirling dervish, I think some of his people, even his supporters, are like, enough. Yeah. Enough with the tweets, enough. And so since he's not on the ballot, and you know he's trying to, they, they could stay home. They yeah. could very easily stay home. A lot of really passionate Trump supporters could just lose a little of that passion. That's, that's when you'll know. If you start hearing, and I do, my friends who are Trump saying, God, if he would just throw away the Twitter machine, if he would just shut up for a few days. And yet he can't. I mean, that, I think that is, for people like me, the, the reluctant Trump supporters who have stuck with him more than I would wish over the past two years. But I would say, for me, that's the November 7th, the day after Election Day question. Do they want him for another four years? Right. I think at that point, the dynamics on the Republican side might change a lot. But just to get back to before then, I mean, that for me, yeah, the Senate's very interesting. I mean, you could imagine Democrats picking up two, three, four seats, I think, Arizona, Nevada, maybe Tennessee, maybe you know, one of the others even. Uh, the question is what happens in the Trump in the in the states where Trump had huge margins. Right. Because if you have a nationalized election about Trump, which I suppose we're going to have to some degree, I mean he is the biggest issue really, right? Um, doesn't that help the Republican challengers in Missouri, Indiana, Missouri, North Dakota, Indiana, North Dakota, West Virginia, maybe Montana, yes. yeah, in Montana. Yeah. But and so, so you, far it's it, not. Well, it, that's what's hard to tell, I guess. Yeah. Democrats do not and should not want to make this simply a referendum on right. Trump. We've had enough conversations about Trump. Trump can sort of make it a referendum on Trump in right. a way, right? If he but screams and yells enough, how do the they, Democrats... I think what their line should be is, Donald Trump is not on the ballot, but your health care is. Yeah. Your job is, your farm is, your Medicaid I is. I will save that for you, and you can't count on the Republicans. Right. And so ironically, they campaign more against the Republican congressional agenda than against yes, Trump. Absolutely. Yeah, well, we'll be interested to see if they can pull that off. Because the Democrats have to win in districts that Trump carried. And telling voters you're stupid is not a winning message for the Democrats. We've tried that. Yeah, well. Right? Going to good people who I think were in a lot of pain, and pain is often expressed in anger, they turn to Trump to be a wrecking ball. And going to them and saying, you screwed up my country, you're horrible, you're a racist, you're stupid, they, they tend not to like that. <laughs> so right. I think instead saying, look, I get that. As my old boss used to say, I feel your pain. Now, let me tell you the threat that this tax cut poses to your Social Security retirement. I can save it. And that is something Democrats have credibility on. So I think that's a far better message than just hating on Trump. And if a Mueller report comes out in the summer and it does have genuine problematic stuff for the president that would lead legitimately, let's just say, to at least consideration of impeachment, how much does that then become the dominant question in the fall? You know, are you for or against impeaching yeah, Trump? I think that that's not where they, I don't think that should be a, an electoral issue. I really don't. It'll come up, I suppose. It hasn't really yet on the yeah. campaign trail. It'll be interesting to see whether the Democrats can actually keep it from being one and whether Trump just doesn't make it one. I guess I come back to that. If I'm Trump, I go to Missouri and say, you know what, you want me to be president and Claire McCaskill is trying to, you know, end, I don't know, end my presidency or something like that. Or she's just knee-jerk anti-Trump and I need Josh Hawley there to help me. But maybe that doesn't work if, if the agenda itself isn't that popular. And if the Democrats themselves don't play into that. Right. And very often, Democrats have played into Trump's agenda. They, they are not on this and they will not, I believe, having talked to them. Now they have on other things. 
right? Trump is great about throwing out shiny eyes. He would have been a great bass fisherman. Yes, to give a good example of what we're having. Yeah, the, the Colin Kaepernick, the football player who kneels during the national anthem, right. okay? By the way, that's a reverential gesture. It's not one I would do. I just wouldn't. It's not how I'm wired. I, I love my country, mm -hmm. revere the flag. My father was buried under that flag. I get it. But I also respect peaceful, reverential protest. I mean, taking a knee is not exactly a middle finger. It's a very right. reverential way. In fact, he was advised by a, a Green Beret that that would be a respectful, reverential way to protest. So anyway, he does it. Said so we can have this discussion. That's not what Donald Trump wants, right? right. So he right. attacks the football players. Democrats grab the bait, and now all of a sudden, we're the party of people disrespecting the flag. Well, no, wait a minute. Can we get back to like middle class jobs? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, we shut down the government over DACA. It was a mistake. We care about DACA. We care about these dreamers, these kids who come here through no fault of their own. We shut down the whole government. Really, for 800,000 young people in a country of 320 million, that, that was Trump baiting the Democrats into doing something that it was seen, I think, as extreme and um, ill-advised. So we've had a f several examples. He banned transgender troops. We run, you know, I just think that Democrats are learning to keep their eyes on the prize, focus on the main thing, not allow Mr. Trump to set the tempo, as the military folks say, right? Don't set the tempo, don't set the terms. We're gonna set the tempo and the terms. And that's, I think, a much wiser strategy. Do you think the electoral, the, the senators and congressmen, the candidates can control that? Or do you get sort of the cultural left just kind of screams and yells and it sort of overwhelms everything in terms of what people see? I mean, I guess that would be the question. Right, right? that'll be an interesting thing to watch. Right. So far, Do people in Missouri no. think it's Claire McCaskill or the New York Times there? they're voting for, if you know what I mean. Right, but I, I think so far, uh, we haven't seen that, but we, we just haven't. And uh, in fact, in many ways, if there are sort of out-of-state extremists come into Missouri, right. West Virginia or something, that actually allows the Democrats to say, well, actually, that's not for me. Yeah. Those aren't my, they can push off against uh, their own party in a way that they're very comfortable doing. I mean, you don't get to be a senator from West Virginia, Montana, North Dakota, Missouri, Indiana without being comfortable pushing off uh, against parts of your own party. So what does it look like after November 6, 2018? So let's assume Democrats control the House by you know, 10 seats or 15. Republicans maybe hold the Senate by one or two. Then what happens? And how does that play into 2020? I right, mean, it, I guess. it goes one of two ways. Either they do what I would not advise, which is politicize impeachment and spend all their time trying to get rid of Trump, which is not gonna happen. I mean, he may fall of his own potential criminality, but not because Democrats are pursuing a impeachment. Um, that's one option, and it's a, it's a live option. I think it's less likely. I think what they'll do, it was what we did, Bill, when you were in the White House. I was working for Dick Kephart, the majority leader, before I went to work for Bill Clinton, and the Democrats on the Hill had a strategy when George H.W. Bush was president going into his reelection. Pass popular bills that the president will veto raise the minimum wage. The Democrats actually passed a very good campaign reform bill, which we couldn't pass under Clinton because they knew he'd sign it. <laughs> so right, right, it was a right. free vote. But they passed a lot of stuff uh, that they knew the president would veto. So that they passed Clinton some stuff he signed. Family too, medical leave. They did, but going into the election. Americans with Disabilities Act, right, that was, Clean that Air was, Act, which that was, was before. 91, I guess. Oh, right. 90 or 91, yeah, yeah. Right, 90, 91. You got into 92, and yeah. they passed uh, uh, family medical leave, passed, uh, as I recall, a campaign finance reform, I think minimum wage. But this is what the Democrats should do now, right? If they have the House, maybe even the Senate, they should actually govern. They should actually well, that's treat big, this like it's I on mean, the level. So, I'd say you're about, I mean, I think this is intelligent advice and all Democrats watching this should, <laughs> can take it if they wish. But I would say if you talk to most Democrats that I've talked to, but maybe I'm not talking to the actual candidates, but sort of the echo chamber, let's say, the Washington DC liberal echo chamber, is all about, whoa, when we take over the House, the investigation, Scott Pruitt's not going to get away with this at EPA, and, and Trump's not going to get with it, Jared's not going to get away with that. I'm not even saying that's wrong, incidentally, to have some oversight. Right. But you could imagine that drowning out the what, what you would like to have be dominant, you right? You could. You could. They should not walk away from oversight, and I do think that there's a lot going on that people need to uncover. But there is a place for that. There's a silo for that, and there are able people, we hope, uh, to take over those committees who can look into it, and if their manner is judicious, if it's thorough and fair, I think that's great. I think it's badly needed. 
that cannot be the substance. That can't be the reason to take over the House. It can't. It's simply to stop what, what I believe is some remarkably corrupt activity going on in the executive branch. We actually have to understand that there's a vast country out there whose needs are being ignored. Now, not only are these guys fleecing you, they're ignoring the fact that the roads and bridges are crumbling. They're ignoring the fact that life expectancy for a lot of working Americans is dropping. It didn't even drop during the Depression. And nobody seems to care about it in the current government. I mean, if I'm Donald Trump and I was elected by those guys and they were dying before their time, holy smokes, I would be out there. He seems to not actually be acting on opioids. He seems to, not, uh, he seems to be harming the farm economy. So I think Democrats should be moving into the space he has abandoned, which is middle-class jobs, middle-class economics, middle-class values. The big fight will be entitlements. Hmm. The speaker has targeted this. He has said, well, now that we've passed this big tax cut, oh, we've discovered that we have a terrible deficit. We have to pay that off by cutting retirement and health care for seniors and Medicaid for uh, working people and poor people. That is a fight that Democrats want and can win. And I think that's where this is going. I think that's just where the math is. So the congressional Democrats, by your account, let's assume do an intelligent 91, 92 type strategy if you want to, when you work for But of course, ultimately, that it was Clinton who won in 92, and Clinton ran as you, as you know very well, as a different kind of Democrat, a new kind of Democrat. And what, how does that, I mean, you need the presidential candidate ultimately Absolutely. to make this work. So talk a little bit about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. One of the tragedies of today is if you stop any Democrat on the street and say, what does your party stand for? The chances of you getting a consistent answer are zero. Getting any answer are zero. Some of that is because of the diversity of the party, which is a great thing, but a lot of it is because we don't have one clear leader and nothing grows in the shade. And we had Barack Obama, who was wonderfully articulate and could always tell us what our party stood for. Maybe the rest of us got a little flabby. So now President Obama's retired. Democrats have to figure out for themselves. In 2020, we'll do that. So what happens then? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Do we, do we say, look, I just want to win. I want to find somebody pragmatic who can win back some of those Trump states, who can entice some of those Trump voters to come back? Um, or do we say, I'm going to be uh, the same as Trump, I'm going to be a mirror image? Right? I think that's a mistake. I think David Axelrod said this. He said, well, usually when we change presidents, it's because we want a remedy, not a replica. Now, I, the problem with that is reciprocity runs very deep in the human soul. And so yeah. you see Donald Trump, you have Kirsten Gillibrand dropping F-bombs in her speeches. I know. Really? Yeah. Really? Is that what we I need? need? That I think is a, like an under, I mean, it's a trivial thing in a way. Well, but a friend you know, of mine who worked in, in the Bush White House and in the earlier Bush White House made this point to me, that that is really short term, yes, some activists and people on Twitter think that's amusing and cute. That is really bizarre, the idea that that's going to appeal to actual voters, you well, know what, what I mean? What it does it is shows, it, it I mean, mirrors Trump. Yeah. And I think that's a mistake. I understand the, the impulse, but the notion that you could ever out-vulgar Donald Trump right. is, is nonsense. Um, and I think it's, it's bad for the country. This is the problem. Once you set a norm, people tend to follow it. Once you shatter a norm, people tend to abandon it. And this is a challenge for my side. Can we answer Trump by being the opposite, not the mirror? And I don't know. I think yes. I think the early signs so far, if you look at Ralph Northam in Virginia, if you look at Doug Jones in Alabama, if you look at Connor Lamb in Pennsylvania, Patty Schachner, who won a, in Wisconsin in a very, very Trump state Senate district, she literally, her message was decency, dignity, cooperation. What the voters are telling us is they want Democrats who are the opposite of Trump in tone and temperament as well as agenda. And, and uh, I'm not sure at all in 2020 if the activists in my party will feel the same way. They may love it. They may want someone who throws more F-bombs and mocks Mr. Trump's hands or whatever stupid, vulgar crap he's throwing out. I think it'd be a huge mistake. Uh, I, I think that, you know, Democrats, their strategy for 2020 ought to be Mrs. Obama's. Michelle Obama famously said, when they go low, we go high. 
easy to say, hard to do. Yeah, should be should be a pretty. I always thought she would Come be a pretty on. good candidate. I, I you know, when she it. spoke at this last convention, I said this on the air. I said, you know, Barack Obama is one of the greatest orators in American history, and he's only the second best speaker in his own house. Mm -hmm. That's how talented she is. Sadly, she's not a politician. I think she has zero interest. But holy smokes, is she good? So I guess the question is, in the real dynamics of a. And we should talk this through a little since you've been through it on like a much closer, much higher level than most 99.99% of Americans. And the real dynamics of a presidential primary, in this case, a lot of people running, right? Isn't, I mean, the activists, some of the activist donors even, I'd say on the Democrat, the groups, doesn't all of that conspire to push them to the left, in effect, or to the, to the strident, let's say? I mean, how do you distinguish yourself if there are 14 people That's on stage? That's right, and it's really hard to distinguish yourself by being the most civil. And you're on, a, you're on a stage with 10 or 20. I mean, there were 16, 17 credible Republicans, plausible Republicans the last time. I think there'll be at least that many Democrats. It's a huge number of senators. There's a reasonable number of governors. And there is a growing number of potential outsider, billionaire business people, and a couple of really impressive mayors. Right. Not the least of whom is uh, just this week finished his term in New Orleans, Mitch Landry. I don't think any mayors jumped straight from a mayoralty to the White House in history. No. But no one has jumped from a, 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 a reality TV show either. Right. No, no, I agree. Post-Trump, it seems silly to have all these historical, right. uh, you know, uh, cautions or whatever you'd call them, but guidelines. But so what, and I, have, I do not have a favorite in that field at all. I really don't. But I think that will be the challenge is how do I stand out without being the one who throws out an F-bomb or chance lock him up? You know, it's really going to be difficult. This is why I'm very bullish about 2018. I'm terribly worried about 2020. Democrats think that Trump's going to be easy to beat. They're completely wrong. I've seen this movie. Yeah, it was a bit of a black swan, but he, when you get why, him. Why, why? Yeah, so let's talk about that for a bit. I mean, why do you think, as a reelect, he hasn't expanded his base at all? I mean, the demographics are slightly against him. Mm -hmm. The economy's not going to stay this strong probably for three years. I and mean, why isn't it, uh, you know, probably a Democratic year anyway? Because he's really good at one-on-one, -on -one, the demonization. Yeah, yeah, I, I have family and friends who voted for Donald Trump. And to a person, if you talk to them long enough, you get this phrase. You know, I really felt like I had no choice. Yeah. Really? Now, I love Hillary. I think she'd have been a great president. She'd yeah. be on Mount Rushmore. She's, but I, I do have to respect that a lot of people felt that way. And I think that will be his message again. You have no choice. Yeah, I'm kind of vulgar, I'm kind of a jerk, but I'm your jerk, and you have no choice. His capacity, his ability to demonize uh, is spectacular. And there is no bottom. He accused Ted Cruz of having a father who could have been complicit in the Kennedy assassination. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing he won't say. And, uh, you know, that, that sadly proved very effective this last time around. So I, I don't think Democrats should at all think that this thing is going to be easy. It's very difficult to dislodge an incumbent president in any situation. Seen, yeah. And someone with this capacity to say or do absolutely anything. And don't you think, I think a Democratic House or even a Democratic Congress marginally helps Trump for 2020, just as it probably helped Clinton in, for 96 and Obama in 2012. You sort of, if you're, of the, if you're a swing voter, you feel like, well, he's being checked. I mean, it's not out of control. Right. You know, I remember the Republican, is, you know, Republicans got a little complacent and not just complacent. So swing voters decided, well, fine, we'll have Clinton as president. We've got a Republican Congress. It's sort of they're taking care of they're checking each other. You can imagine. I mean, it's going to be so chaotic and they, bitter that you wonder whether it will feel that way in 2020 is the question, I suppose. But anyway, but I agree. What with we you don't know I mean, is 2019. Yeah. What, what? Let's say the Democrats take the House. It's entirely possible, not likely, it's possible that this president embraces the Pelosi agenda. Yeah, or at least uh, attacks both the leadership of both parties similarly. You think actually embraces If the I were him, he, he will say or do anything. He sat in right. two meetings that. on national television, one of which on immigration, where he told the Democrats, I will sign a bill protecting the dreamers that does nothing else with right. no money for my wall. He said it. Of course, then he lied. He sat down with Dianne Feinstein and other gun control advocates and said, if you pass a bill that simply restricts uh, ownership of certain assault weapons and expands background checks, I will sign it with nothing more. In fact, some Republicans pushed back in the meeting. He said, no, no, just this. Now, he didn't do it, but what if he did? What if the Democrats did pass 
an increase in the minimum wage? What if they did pass a really a real infrastructure program, not this nonsense he's pushing out now. So, oh, a real trillion dollar infrastructure package. What if they did raise some taxes on the rich and cut them on the middle class? What if they actually did the things they're campaigning? What if they shored up Obamacare and Medicaid, right? It's not inconceivable. This guy is not a person of principle. No, no, I, I think he would you. likely, I mean, I think they'd have to give him something, you know, a little money for the wall, a little money for the, you know, but it, it right. wouldn't take much for, to let him declare victory, have a big signing ceremony, which he would love. And because that, he's a demagogue and he's a populist and he simply wants to be popular. Right. So remember, he, he opposed Obamacare. Well, what are you for? He said, I'm for way better, greatest health care ever for less money. Yeah. So he would sell a diet book, to eat ice cream and lose weight. Right, right, right. right. This is not a guy given to either tough choices or a, a, a lodestar of principle. I mean, he's not Ronald Reagan. <laughs> You it was before my time, but you always knew where Reagan was going to come out. If Democrats could pass anything, and he would say, "No, that's not in concert with my principles." Right. Or if you had compromised, it was kind of a principled compromise. You right. might say, "With okay, I'm going to give them this, but I'll get this." And right. But and yeah. he his he may do that. He may become. Keep in mind the Democrat, or the the politician he's given the most money to in his life is Chuck Schumer. Yeah. So he is. He might. If I were advising him, I would. I would say, you're now a Democrat for the next two years. You get with them, cut deals, yeah, get some fig leaf of, for your stupid wall or something, but we're gonna sign Protect Dreamers, we're gonna expand uh, 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 the background checks on guns, we're gonna raise a minimum wage. He's just gonna get a poll and he's gonna do, or he's pretty good a bit in his innate polling, and just, he's gonna support anything that hits 60% in a poll. He doesn't care if it comes to the left, the right, the center. Maybe not. Maybe he'll yeah, well, that's be so question. backed into a corner. The Mueller thing is a bit right. of an overhang. <laughs> and I would agree with you that he's surprisingly been very much felt indebted to the core Republican groups mm -hmm. and hasn't wanted to cross them and the NRA and so forth. I mean, it's a little – why he thinks he has to go that far in that direction I'm a little, is a little bewildering. But um, though I, he must have learned the lesson somewhere you just need to have your base. I mean, you need to have your base. And he could be persuaded that – but, but how could he lose his base, really, running against the Democrat in 2020? There's no way. He could sign every Democratic piece of legislation, and all the Trump people will stick with him, obviously, against any. If Christian evangelicals can overlook Stormy Daniels, they could certainly overlook raising the minimum wage. Yeah. <laughs> A lot well, of his voters are yeah, populist, well, economic, former sort of, Democrats. Yeah, as long as he can, is tough on judges and a couple of other things. Guns actually might be one where he has to be tougher. I mean, the funny thing is he can compromise much more on the economic issues and sell out the kind of Republican economic agenda. Interesting. I think maybe then on some of these more emotional issues where his voters seem to have much more uh, sort of stake. But uh, so that's interesting. So you think he's underestimated in the sense that he could cleverly tack to the uh, center, if you want to call it that, but let's just say, uh, you know. He could. What I don't know. In 2019. I don't know. I, I don't think the entire faculty of the Harvard Department of Psychiatry can figure out his psyche. Right. I, because I don't know. That would be a really cagey. He's very cagey. He's very canny. I, I recently wrote a piece saying, don't call him an idiot. I know all his aides do. They call yeah. him effing moron. No, no, idiot. that's silly. He's clever. He's, he's very clever. Not, Most con men are very bright people. Yes, that's ex and I think he's especially when they've been doing clever. the long con for right. thirty years. I right, mean, really, you know. So, but what I don't know, he also seems um, very emotional, and he he has these fits of pique. Right. And the the Mueller thing is putting so much pressure on him. I cannot imagine. I just can't. And so there, there's, that's the counterbalance. That's the counter argument. Is that the sensible thing would be to be KG and cut deals with the Dems, thereby ensuring your own reelection. Well, he's going to be so pinched. Again, maybe he's completely in the clear. I tend to doubt it. It looks like he's guilty of everything. Uh, Lindbergh baby kidnapping, everything. Things that happened before he was born. But that he was going to lash out then, and he's going to blame the Democrats who will be doing oversight. So there may, he may go the other way, which I think is not in his interest, but he very often seems to act contrary to his long-term interests. I think one other question, just thinking back to Clinton, 95, 96, when you, which you were very much involved in, obviously. Were you led in the White House yet? Or? No, I was not yet in the White House till a second term. I was but an outside advisor working first on it, Yeah, I mean, that was a competently run White House, especially once Pettit took over, and mm -hmm. had a competently run campaign, and there were some tensions, and Dick Morris was doing his thing, so maybe it wasn't quite... In, in retrospect, we make it look more confident than it was, or more uh, orderly than it right. was. I'm sure if at the time it was crazy with Dick Morris being snuck in at 10 at night or something like that. 
But still, the Trump White House has a level of dysfunction that's unlike anything we've seen, I think. We've right? never seen anything like that. And so, can he even, put, that's where I think you could argue it's, he could, even if his instinct was to go in the direction you're suggesting, that would take a fair amount of cleverness and discipline and organization and having cabinet secretaries who understood that this is what they were supposed to do in their relevant areas. It's not clear he has anyone, you know, or chief of staff like Panetta right. who would figure out, okay, we're going to have to sign welfare reform here in, in 96, you know, to take the example. Well, his example. substantive, this is where it helps to know stuff. <laughs> yeah. You remember in Animal House, the, the, the statue, it's the opening scene. They show the statue of Emil Faber, the founder of the, of the college, and his, his words of wisdom etched in marble at the base are, knowledge is good. Mm-hmm. Hey, Trump sandblasts that off, but knowledge is good. Uh, President Clinton knew what he wanted, for example, on welfare reform. So he vetoed two Republican versions of it. Right. Then signed a third. It still was not exactly what he wanted, but he understood they ran the Congress. So he, and, and it, so he compromised on that. Then he refused to compromise when he wanted to cut Medicare. He said, no, that's principle. And understanding that difference, both substantively and politically, that really matters. And Trump doesn't have that experience and that mastery. And I worry my country that he doesn't seem to be wanting to surround himself with people of substantive mastery when, when, when you when you look at that white house from the outside uh and you you just see the leaks and the lies and the conduct you, you just think this is not the a team but i guess it could be good enough depending on so let's go back to the democrats like all conversations and donald trump's washington we've started up we've we drifted into a, con- a very interesting conversation i think <laughs> about trump and his possible strategy in 2019 but of course he is a key player in in the Democratic primary right. race, ironically, right? But what? So I guess a lot of my Republican friends, and I, I sort of half believe this, say, look, I mean, this is all very nice that you, Paul Begala, think this, but at the end of the day, Bernie Sanders got 45% of the vote all in in the Democratic primary, about half the white vote, if I'm not mistaken, and it really right. was the minority of African Americans in particular who saved Hillary Clinton. There was a strong attachment to her, and he wasn't very effective right. in getting those votes. Um, I, by the way, I'm glad that you understand that. I get so many people that say, oh, it was rigged or whatever. Bernie lost because he could not crack Hillary's core appeal with people of color. Yeah. It's it? like in the Republican Party. If you can't get Christian evangelicals, I think, you can't. That's the heart of the party. It's not the majority of the party, but it's so essential to the coalition. If you can't crack people of color, and it wasn't that Bernie had any problems. He has a terrific record on civil rights. It's that Hillary had... 40-year relationship yeah, with he that had, community. Vermont does not have much, you know, he didn't right. have much of a relationship. So, but that won't be the case in 2020. There's no Hillary Clinton with that kind of right. connection or Bill Clinton's connection in 91, 92, which also was, for all that he was a new Democrat and the most moderate, he also had huge support in the African-American community. But, and African-American voters tend to be well, that's the more priority, right? moderate yeah. than the white liberals. Yeah. And again, sometimes people outside the party don't understand that, but the People of color are the stabilizing force in my party. They're the most important, I think, well, I hate to say best, but you know what I mean? They're not, right. they're not folks who go off on crazy tangents. They're people who really care about the kind of elemental meat and potatoes democratic issues that I think are the most important ones. But the dynamic of 84 and 88, if we can go back to ancient history, and you were like 12 years old or something then, but still you were, you were already slightly, you were in politics then, or graduated from college at least, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, so that dynamic was multi-candidate races against an incumbent right. in 84, an incumbent vice president in 88, which probably did, I don't know if they drove the party to the left exactly, but mm-hmm. they certainly didn't let it come to the center much, where there were much more, you know, there was an African-American candidate, Jesse Jackson, representing that wing, and then there were other candidates <laughs> representing other special interests, so to speak, uh, and you end up nominating a Mondale or a Dukakis, who right. by current standards are not raving left-wingers, but were probably difficult to elect in the context of that decade. And so I guess that would be the sort of alternate account of, 20, of 2020. Many candidates running, they start fragmenting into sort of identity groups almost, mm-hmm. a lot of payoff to appeal to the most activist types and the most fervent donor types. And no one person kind of organizes the center, the centrist right. Democrats. This is the challenge. With African-American support maybe, which would be the ideal mix the, yeah the, the clinton election in the primaries i think turned on two things first doug wilder chose not to run hmm. we were scared to death of mario cuomo but at the end of the day we're confident enough it, cuomo was amazing but we're confident enough in clinton's talent that he could defeat even mario cuomo hmm. we really did believe that it would be tough we were really glad when he got out of the race doug wilder first off just as talented 
as Doug, Cuomo. Just for our young viewers. Doug Wilder, the like, first African-American mayor, uh, governor, uh, governor uh, of, of Virginia. The uh, first African-American governor I th in America since Reconstruction. I, I think believe. that's right. Remarkable sitting at that, I'm trying to remember now. Sitting governor at that point. He was elected in 1989. So he's yes, a sitting, sitting governor, governor of Virginia. In 91, yeah. Doing a great job. <coughs> Spectacular talent. Go find old YouTube's Doug Wilder campaign. And you will see a guy who knows what he's doing. Doug was thinking about running. When he got out of the race, he didn't get in, rather. When he chose not to run, that made Clinton the only candidate who'd ever really gotten a sizable number of African-American voters. And Jesse didn't run, right? Jesse Jackson. chose not to run. It was, I, didn't, I don't think really seriously considered running. Uh, so the rest of the field, they were talented, but it was, uh, you know, it was Jerry Brown in, in California. It was Bob Carey from Nebraska. It was Paul Songus from Massachusetts. Um, and and uh, they didn't have the same, particularly Southern African-Americans, right? Clinton is the heart of Clinton's coalition. Had Doug Wilder gotten a race? So it was that first, is that he was the only guy who had the lock, not the lock, but the long appeal with African-American voters, especially in the South. But then second, we were tired of losing. Yeah. Well. The party activists did not become more moderate, but they believed Clinton when he said, I'll pursue a progressive agenda. I'm not sure all your hopes and dreams. He was for NAFTA and welfare reform and 100,000 cops and the death penalty. But he said, you know, I can win and these guys can't. And his charisma, his ability to unify, that, that was really critical. But you needed the Mondale and Dukakis defeats, yes. especially Dukakis where he'd been ahead. And people forget how much 17 the points ahead, 110 was that Bush days was out. so weak, right. George H.W. Bush. That, I think that was, the, that was a blow to, to Democrats. It was. Uh, and, and Dukakis had tried to get away from right. the left. He said it's about competence, not ideology. But then Bush didn't let him. Exactly. Uh, so so we, we, we inherited. Right. McGovern, Carter, who'd won once, but then had lost. So we McGovern, Carter, Mondale, Dukakis. Right. And Democrats were tired of losing. So we had this great base in the African-American community, especially in the South. And then we had a lot of folks who themselves weren't all that moderate, but they voted for Clinton because they thought this guy could win because he was so talented. Uh, so they were pragmatic, strategic voters. I have no idea if that's the view of the Democrats yeah. today. I have or no is idea. It, or is it 84 or 88 where they just vote for whoever they... You know, they're angry, they vote against the incumbent president. Um. Right, I have no idea. Uh, it'll be, but this will be a wonderful way for the Democrats to flesh out what they stand for. And there are lots of new ideas coming out. You had a little bit of this in Virginia in the governor's race, but I really wanna see a little bit with Hillary and Bernie. I wanna see my party debate, for example, free college. Senator Sanders and some others have said that, what free college. Yeah, what does that mean though, yeah. What does that mean? Now, here I am, a you know, well-off white guy in the suburbs. I'm putting a bunch of kids through college. I, I, my kids don't deserve free college, to tell you the truth. Right. I, I, I don't believe that it's as a, a populist. Well, as, a, as an actual empirical matter, it would be a redistribution up the income scale, not down it. I think so. More and, upper middle class kids go to college than poor kids. Right. And right. So, you know. My problem with this is two things. It's free and it's college. Yeah, right. Okay, the Democrats tend to be labeled as the party of something for nothing. And, and the party of smarty pants intellectual uh, arrogance. Okay, what if instead we say what Ralph Northam said in Virginia, which is, I oppose free college. Ralph said this in the primaries when Perriello was running on free college. He said, I went to the Virginia Military Institute. I earned my college by serving my country in combat as a physician. And if you want to serve, right, I think this would be an opening. I, I think we should have universal college, community college, job training apprenticeship for anyone who serves. Marine Corps, AmeriCorps, Peace Corps. You we have to serve it. your country. For people who serve in the military, we virtually have we that do now, now with the GI Bill. Yeah. We do now, thank God. And we have AmeriCorps, but it's not nearly to scale. I, I, honestly, that's the sort of big idea I'm looking for because I think we have two big problems in America. We have this opportunity inequality, which I think can, it can be ameliorated with better skills. And we have this social tension where we're coming apart. Well, if we reintegrate, yeah, I have a brother-in-law who's a millionaire banker in New York. You know what? He was in the army. He crawled through the mud in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And you know what? That really changed him. He right. can't be an elitist. He can't hate, you know, rednecks or people of color because he crawled around in the mud with them serving in the army. And my generation doesn't have that. And the next generation doesn't have that. So I really want to see us reintegrate. and. 
uh, you could do both of those things with universal service. From that, you can earn your apprenticeship, job training, community college, or university aid. That's the way to do it, because then that's reciprocal. It's back to what, what I think President Clinton uh, preached and President Obama preached, which is this is about reciprocal responsibilities. You know, and, and I, I don't want to see Democrats get away from that. But th those kinds of arguments will be played out. Do you think governors or mayors have a better chance, yeah. as Clinton did, to make those kinds of, or are more inclined to make those kinds of arguments than senators and congressmen? Yes, yes. I think that, I think prudentially in our history, we've preferred governors, vice presidents, uh, Civil War generals from the right. Union side. Right. Uh, but we don't. World War, people who won World War II. People, yeah, people who saved the world. Um, the, you know, the, I mean, you know this, but the McCain-Obama race is the only time in American history when each party nominated a sitting senator. Yeah. We just don't do that. And so we have a lot of great senators thinking about it. I think voters prudentially are going to look at uh, governors. I think some of these mayors thinking about it are very impressive. And then some of these business people outside of the system. But what about that? Do you think the Democrats are tempted because, well— Trump, well, certainly the millionaires, the billionaires are tempted. They're looking at Trump, right, and thinking, if he won, how come I can't win? Right. But do you think at the end of the day, the Democrats, will there be a real opening for that kind of outsider? I think the opening for anything. Yeah. I really do. So it's really a wild card race. Yes. And what they say, how they conduct themselves, you know, we won't know. How do they get attention? I guess that would be one. I can see how someone gets attention on an impeachment hearing. Right. In the House, you know, if there are impeachment uh, proceedings, Barbara Jordan did. I mean, she's my president, but you know that kind of thing, right? You're right. the most eloquent spokesman right. for. But not she was not the most strident. She was a well. Very, that's a good point. She's yeah. actually one of my wife's professors. I didn't really know her well, but my yeah, wife was know. a. She was like a mentor to my wife. So, very, you know, right. she was so judicious. Again, young people should go find YouTube tapes of those hearings, and you will see a Houston congressman raised in segregation, upholding the Constitution in the most eloquent, beautiful, judicious way. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, we'll see if right? They, she was we'll not the most strident, those, screaming, yes. lock him up. Yeah. You know? She, it was, uh, I, seriously, when I worked in the White House, I had her portrait in my office. Is that right? Yeah, I had a, a photographic portrait of her put up. She had just died, or, or she was still alive? She was still alive then, but she I so admired her. Again, I didn't know yeah. her well, but, but she was she she was really good to my wife, and, and no, uh, was good. her uh, professor. No, she was impressive. So, I mean, I guess the question then is, uh, if you're a Mitch Landrieu, whom I know you know, right. the mayor of New Orleans, who's just finished his office? or is Just that... this week has uh -huh. finished his term. Very, I know slightly, very impressive guy. I mean, how does he get the attention to even get considered? I mean, I guess that's the challenge someone like him faces, or an right. outside businessman, or another mayor, or Governor Bullock of Montana. I hear in, in the sort of Clinton Democrat circles, there's some right. interest in him. I, I've never, I don't know much about him, but... I think any of them... It's a little like that uh, that movie Gypsy. You got to have a gimmick, right? You got to have something. For Mitch, he gave a speech that I think I, I say this, and I know people are going to be shocked. I think it ranks up there with any Obama speech. It is as good a speech about race in America. This is the Confederate monuments from a, about speech. the Confederate monuments. This is from a Southern white boy in New Orleans, uh, and he gave the most beautiful, intelligent, historical, and nuanced speech on this, on why uh, General Lee had to come down. And I think people are going to, that, that, that's not his only speech. You know, I think they're going to see that kind of claim. But it's, it, it's that sort of thing, right? It's not simply their record of accomplishment. I'm sure he's filled a lot of potholes and addressed crime and schools are better. It's not simply that for any of these people, or, or Steve Bullock in Montana, who was who has the wonderful uh, claim that he was reelected solidly on the same day his state went for Donald Trump by 20, 25 points. Hmm. Uh, that's impressive, you know, a really good Democrat running in a really red state and governing effectively with a Republican legislature. Uh, I, I wouldn't encourage too many of them to talk too much about the endless details of you know how they fix the sewer pipes in Bozeman. Right, but instead, use that as a lifting off point. Right, that's what President Obama, Senator Obama, did. He would right. only been in the Senate like five minutes. Right, and he had—I don't mean to be unfair to him, but I think like he, he worked hard on the ethics reform, and and put in real time there. But mostly, what he was was aspirational and inspirational. Right. But people forget. I mean, he and Luger did some legislation together, and he traveled with Luger, as I recall, to Russia, and that did help 
convey the sense that he wasn't simply a partisan right. left winger, though he was in some ways to the left, I'd say, you'd have to say conventionally speaking, of, of Hillary in 2008. So it helped him, I think, take the edge off that. And you think, and, t and you find it talking to these well, people. Well, but he had this claim. I'm sorry to interrupt, but no, no, in the same way that Landry does about the statues, he had this claim. As an obscure state senator, he spoke out against the war. Yes. And Hillary voted for it. Yeah, no, that was huge, obviously. But for that, uh, I, I think he might not have, even with all his talent. No, he wouldn't have, yeah. He, he was, because that negated the experience argument. He said, well, yeah, you have all the experience, Hillary, but on the most important vote of your life, you were wrong. And the Democrats certainly felt that way. So uh, I think all these Democrats are looking at that, too. Like, what's my one claim? You know, you're only going to have eight seconds as they try to cover the entire field. And some of it will be just the stupid stuff. Who raises the most money? Although Trump blew that canard out of the water, too, thank goodness. Yeah. Who has the highest poll ratings? Who's going to—you know, one thing tr Trump did leverage was fame. He was a pre-aware totally title, guess, as our I've... friend Mike Murphy says. He's a what? Mike Murphy taught me this. He's a big Hollywood mogul now. You're I'm well aware of that, yes. <laughs> I saw Murphy of this week. <laughs> I can barely like, get him to answer my phone calls oh, now. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, he calls everybody baby now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> so, so Murphy has this wonderful observation about uh, Hollywood wanting pre-aware titles. This is yes. how you get movies about Legos. Yeah, right. No, right? Course, or yeah, Batman. Yeah. Avengers, or too. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And so Star Wars 38. <laughs> right. A pre-aware title, you don't have to spend $100 million dollars explain to people what Legos are. It's the single thing I most underestimated about Trump. Me too. I think the rest of it, I, I don't think I was that wrong. Honestly, I thought there was always room for populists. I thought there was a Buchanan element in the party. I didn't like it, but I didn't think it had gone t totally away, and et cetera, et cetera. I, but the thing I just underestimated was the pure celebrity, the value of his celebrity status, how well-known he was, right. and how much he conveyed a certain image. The other thing about the free aware title is it's the title of a, someone you like, presumably, right? And so, and, and, the Apprentice, which I really hadn't even seen, he's playing himself being a super successful right. and decisive, but also entertaining and sort of engaging business leader. Well, what's not to like, right? I mean, you know, it's better than just being an actor. It's better than being, Absolutely. you know, if you're an actor, then you're just playing a bunch of other roles. It's fine, but I mean, it doesn't really convey, you know. The Trump thing was almost, was uncanny almost in that way, that The Apprentice helped him so much. Well, and it gave him this hybrid status that I certainly failed to understand, too. Completely missed this. That I thought of Trump as, you know, kind of a disgraced businessman. Right. He'd been birther. Four, been, been bankrupt four times. Birther saying racist things. But for most Americans, he was the guy, I think it was Thursday, every Thursday he was in their living room for like 14 years. Yeah. Playing this strong, decisive, and yet approachable billionaire mogul. And that, that helped so much. And the fact that he was an entertainer, not a politician. Somebody told me this once in Texas. It's like, you don't understand. Hillary's a liar. It's like, okay, what do you think Trump is? He said, oh no, Trump's a bullshitter. <laughs> that's, a, that's a difference. Like Hillary lies to me and I'm offended. And Trump's just a BSer. They just, that's just what they do. So you had this completely asymmetrical uh, standard of judging, uh, which he understood and I never did. Yeah, yeah. And, but then I guess that gets back to the question, do the Democrats imitate Trump or, right. or do the opposite? Or, or it doesn't mean that they should imitate his manner or style. But boy, it would be nice if, you know, the Democrats nominate someone who'd ever, like, gutted a deer, changed the oil in his own car, um, you know, drove her own kids to school. <laughs> you know, some, something that connects you back to the middle class. Uh, it would be really helpful. And a lot of these people, I think, who are thinking about running fit that bill. Women, I mean, how big a deal do you think the Me Too movement is? And is it, I mean, it does seem, it would be ironic, I suppose, after Hillary gets defeated, that finally there's a sense that, you know, the systematic, I don't know how to say it exactly, discrimination against women, the right. treatment of women has been, I think I'd say this personally, a little worse than I realized, you know? Right. And, you know what I mean? More pervasive and, 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 and so, does that change the dynamics presidentially at all? Or? I think it does. I think that, um, that the way Hillary was treated, not only by Mr. Trump, but by the media, is uh, Democrats are increasingly seeing as unfair. Uh, and I don't think they want to make the same mistake. Uh, I think there's a lot of younger women. You know, Madeleine Albright got in trouble. Yeah. She said, there's a special place in hell for young women don't support Hillary. Because well, she's, like Hillary, part of a, a pioneering feminist generation. 
and a lot of younger women raised after Roe v. Wade. Uh, we now have at universities at least 50, 55 percent of the students. I mean, nobody can imagine Hillary being one of two or three law students at Yale or Sandra Day O'Connor, the top of her class in Stanford, being unable to get a job as a lawyer, being only offered jobs as a clerk or a paralegal. People, if you're 21 today, you can't imagine that world. So Madeline said that and she got in a lot of trouble. I actually think a lot of younger women now feel that way. They, they, there's a lot of non-voters remorse. People who at the time said, younger people, and particularly uh, women, uh, wow, I didn't really appreciate like, how big the difference could be. And I think Trump has radicalized and mobilized women in the best way. I, I, again, I've missed so much. I, the older I get, the more I realize I don't know anything about this business. After Trump was elected, I was really upset. I was re and terribly. And what I didn't apprehend is how energized that would be. I, I was depressed. I was not energized. But young people especially, and especially women, were so invigorated. And I think that's great. That's the genius of democracy, is that we can revivify. And, and uh, instead of uh, women and people of color and young people being depressed, they in fact have been more motivated and in the best ways. They're not throwing rocks through the windows at Starbucks. You know, they're registering to vote. It's just great. So in that sense, I think this has been terrific for the country. Me too being an eye opener for guys like us of our generation, but also invigorating women who maybe thought, I heard so many young women especially say this, well, we'll have a woman president. Obviously we'll have one. Right. Well, we've been around a quarter of a millennium. We've never had one yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, can guys be that much more talented? It's preposterous. Obviously there's structural sexism. So. I, I, I think that th th in that sense, Me Too has been uh, a really positive force in this country. And a pretty big one is what I guess I sense. Uh, I, don't know, I don't quite know if it translates into we need to have a woman candidate for this or that office. I'm not sure that's the... Right. I don't either. But I do think that I've been there is a really powerful message. I get this. I've seen this. It's why, I, like I said, a guy that's like changed transmission or a woman, you know, who's been assaulted or at least tried as attempt. I mean, the, the, it's so much more pervasive than, you know, insulated, uh, well-off white guys like me ever knew. And my, my hope is that it's not going to just peter out with Hollywood and Washington, that it gets to the, you know, assistant clerk at the store who's being harassed by the store manager. Right. Uh, I, I really hope it does. And, but it, it, a woman who can say, I've been there, I know. I think that's going to have enormous appeal. So I, I don't think that Democrats are going to say, well, we've nominated a person of color, we've nominated a woman, no more. I don't think that's a, the right answer at all. I think that I'm one of you is still a really powerful message. And oh, having that kind of empathy, irrespective of whether you're white, black, male, or female, is, is critical to being a Democrat. Yeah, I'm one of you is the opposite of Hillary's. I'm with her, though. That was, I, mean, I, I, I did think Trump could win the general when he said at the convention, they say, they want you to say, I'm with her. I'm telling you, I'm with you. And that was a very clever reversal of Hillary's slogan and exposed something true, I think, that the, the Hillary campaign was about Hillary and the Trump campaign, ostensibly, right. was going to be about the people. Well, Bill Clinton's laws, he has so many, but two of them that always come to mind are elections about the future, not the past, which is why all these Democrats thinking of running, don't just run on your accomplishments, run on your agenda. And the second, it's, it's about the voters, not the candidates. Yeah. And he would always say that to me, even in private. That would be like in strategy meetings. We have to make it their lives, not mine. Hmm. And his life, of course, became fodder for the tabloids, and, it be, and he never allowed us to simply fall back into that. And I do think while Trump said it masterfully at his convention, he's not governed that way. Yeah, yeah. It is all about him. He is the most narcissistic, <coughs> solipsistic, selfish person I think we've ever seen. So I think someone out there who says, Look, Clinton said this all the time. So I'm going to be fine either way. Let's just be honest. Okay, I'm fine. Like, I'm going to be fine. The question is, will you be fine? I'm good either way. And so is Hillary, by the way. She's making millions writing books. And I think that, making it, getting it back to folks, to Bill Clinton's call it walking around folks, that's the key for the Dems. I mean, I guess my 
conservative friends, my fellow conservatives might say, well, this is nice, your account of sort of energized but not too radicalized uh, Democrats and, and, and a left wing that's willing to accept the verdict in primaries and stuff, but what about the actual left in America? I mean, it's awfully, it's not just energized, it's shutting down people on campuses, mm -hmm. political correctness is going from level to level and becoming really somewhat uh, anti-liberal, I would say. I mean, how much of a problem is that for the Democrats? How manageable is that in your judgment? It's a real problem. You, you had activists shout down Bernie Sanders at a, at a rally this last time around, as if Bernie somehow is insufficiently progressive. He's not even a Democrat, he's a socialist. Uh, it, I was a very late comer to this too. I mean, I just keep talking about how little I know, but it's what I've realized. Uh, I teach at Georgetown, I've taught there as an adjunct for 18 years. I never, never saw any of this, I really didn't at Georgetown. It's, uh, it's America's greatest Jesuit university, and it celebrates free speech. In fact, Father Leo O'Donovan allowed Larry Flint to come to campus, most notorious pornographer coming to our greatest Catholic university. Wow, that's free speech. So I always thought it was baloney when my conservative friends, uh, I, I'll name him, our buddy Tucker Carlson. Tucker would always say this to me, and I always thought it was crap. So, oh, that's a Fox News myth. You know what, he was right and I was wrong. It wouldn't happen at Georgetown, but now that I'm the father of three college students and another about to go, uh, once graduated, so whatever, but I, I've done the university tour. It is real, and, and, and that the censorious tone says, well, no, free speech does not cover hate speech. Well, what's hate speech? Speech that I hate. <laughs> you know, uh, that's really problematic. If, if liberals don't stand for free expression, especially to university, then all is lost. Then there's no more liberalism. And and I do think that's a skirmish has to happen within my party and within. Now, uh, Barack Obama was early on this too, before I saw it. He was speaking in Michigan. He's supposed to be touting some, like a probably school finance program, but he digressed extemporaneously and talked about how important it is at college to get your feelings hurt, to be challenged, to be made uncomfortable. And it didn't get the same pickup I wished it had uh, because I think that's he's a messenger who progressives will really listen to in a way they, they won't listen to Tucker. Uh, and I, I do think that's a problem. And uh, it's an underappreciated one, or at least it was in my case. Uh, and and, and it, it morphs into the workplace. Nobody wants the kind of animalistic behavior we're learning about from Harvey Weinstein or Mark Halperin or some of these others. So by Eric Schneiderman, the Attorney General of New York. This is why we build prisons, if in fact he's guilty, right? But at the same time, the, the sense that a lot of people have that, that now liberals no longer want free speech. You can't say something unpopular. You can't even say, well, gee, I like Trump, right? Or I oppose this policy or that. Uh, it, it is a problem and it's one that has to be hashed out in the progressive movement. And uh, you'll know that my side is losing when you see prominent politicians like Bernie or Hillary, whoever's running this next time. You see them shouted down at, at a rally. You cannot allow a heckler's veto. You, you have to, I think. If you have a university, you have to allow Ann Coulter or whoever you don't like, Ben Shapiro, whoever the latest you know, uh, uh, boogeyman is on the, on the right. That's the whole point. So I, I think that's a very valid criticism from conservatives. And it's one that, uh, again, all of this will play itself out in 2020, all of it. And uh, I'm, I'm in the Obama camp here. I'm very much, want the free debate, I, want, I, I believe in my ideas, I believe we can win, I believe in the marketplace, and so uh, I very much take my cues from President Obama who said, let's upset people, let's, let's have this fight. You know, that's the whole point. Well, I hope that version of liberalism prevails. One last question, as you mentioned President Obama, it hadn't really occurred to me, like, what, is there any particular role you see him playing or Hillary or Bill Clinton, I mean, or do they, are they just, they stay out and they're kind of- I, I don't, the, I, I don't know. I, I doubt, you know, usually, you know, look, President Obama put his thumb on the scale for Hillary. I think there's been enough reporting to suggest that uh, when, when she was running in the primaries and, and uh, President Clinton really weighed in for Al Gore, almost cleared the field. Bill Bradley's an impressive guy, but Gore won every single primary, every single caucus uh, with Clinton's strong, strong backing. I don't see that happening this time. I don't think uh, President Clinton or Hillary or President Obama, Michelle, I, I, have no, I haven't talked to them. I don't know about 2020 is so far away, but um, I don't think uh, any of them are comfortable thinking of themselves as kingmakers. 
this has this has got to be organic. It's got to bubble up. And I, I, you know, I have faith. I really do. I have faith in in voters, but I don't think that, uh, in fact, that that voters will respond well, even to someone they love, right. like Obama or Clinton. I don't think they'll they'll respond very well to that. And if I were advising someone who was not endorsed by them, I would use it. I'd say, well, I love President Obama, but you know what? He doesn't get to vote in the Iowa caucuses or yeah. New Hampshire primary. You know, I, mean, I, and I think the Democrats that. who've won so far in 2017 and 18 have sort of kept these national figures at arm's length, right? That's a good they, point. They didn't want them coming in much for them. North of, I think, for example. It's Particularly just, in these midterms. Yeah. Uh, we don't. Now, President Obama did come in and campaign for, for Ralph Northam. He was, he was enormously helpful. But in the main, it was his own race. Connor Lamb didn't want anybody. <laughs> right, right. I guess, I guess Joe Biden did come in there. He was right. born in Pennsylvania. Um, but in, in the main, they've been very wise. Uh, Doug Jones was going to have, uh, I think he was going to go up to New York. President Clinton was going to do a fundraiser for him. Clinton knew him, had made him a U.S. attorney, I believe. Canceled all of it. He never left. Once it looked like he had a real chance, he never left the state of Alabama, and he never let anybody come into that state from, wow. from outside. It was really smart. He ran a very smart race. So in the, in the midterms, that will really matter. When you get to 2020 in those early primaries, I still think the better course for the uh, party elders is let's, let's let a new generation take over, and let's see what, what they do. And you think it will be a new generation of the nominee or Biden, Sanders, Warren? Wow. I don't know. I, I, I honestly, it's I, a hard this, thing I think it's the first time in my life I haven't either had a favorite or had a real sense of where the party's going. Uh, I, I just don't know. And so I just say, let's put them all on the track. You know, I know what I want to see, see big ideas. I want to see a middle class focus. I want to see a sense of bringing people together and, and rejecting the politics of demonization. You know, if the Democrats' message is shut up racist, to a third of the country, <laughs> that's not for me. I mean, it's not that there's not racism in America, but I think if you if you try to label and brand and demonize everybody who voted for Donald Trump, that's not not a very good way to to win an election. Well, on the note of not knowing what's going to happen, that's an appropriate <laughs> note to to uh, close on. But you've been very illuminating on on the current moment and what's likely to happen over the next couple of years. And uh, thank you a lot for taking thank you very Thanks, much for taking Bill. the time for this for this conversation. Thanks, Paul. Uh, and thank you for joining us on Conversations.